Hi, everybody. Welcome to this episode of UNLV's Research Files. Tonight's show is about innovation, technology, and partnerships. We'll meet UNLV's new Director of Technology Transfer, and we'll talk to the brains behind a new experimental class in gaming innovation. A lot to talk about. We begin tonight with the Executive Director of Technology Transfer, Zach Miles. Zach, thank you very much for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me. You're new to UNLV. What, uh, what brought you here, and, and what are you seeing so far? So Southern Nevada provides a great opportunity, and I saw that opportunity and decided to come down, and I'm lucky that they were able to, to bring me down and accept me here in, in Southern Nevada, but it really is uh, a, a, a place that's striving to have economic development, and everyone is very interested in, in driving that. Many groups are trying to get there and are now trying to come together and stitch that together so there's a single effort in, in moving that forward from institutional financing and venture capital to the institutions, the universities, to entrepreneurs, to the research faculty and upper administration. Everyone is very aligned with having this as a priority for them and I'm excited to be a part of that. Tell us a little bit about your background. I'm a recovering patent attorney, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to get over that part of, of my life. I have a microbiology and chemistry background, went to law school, and then I've been at the University of Utah for the past 11 years in their technology commercialization office, which they call technology venture and commercialization, and has served as their deputy director for the past uh, four or five years, but have been with them for 11 years. Well, we're glad to have you in Southern Nevada. Thank you. Glad is, to hear. is economic development important to you, to UNLV? It really is important to UNLV. Um, it helps to drive additional research dollars into the organization. It helps to translate new and exciting inventions into products that can be had by the public. Hopefully that will generate new startup opportunities and companies or attract other companies into Southern Nevada where students can find uh, employment, high paying jobs so that there's a workforce development piece. So engaging in that public-private partnership really helps to drive the mission of the university, academics and teaching and research, but also to benefit the public. I said at the beginning that you're the executive director of technology transfer. What exactly is technology transfer? In its simplest form, we assess, manage, protect, and commercialize inventions that come out of the university. So new ideas, we help to assess whether those could turn into viable commercial products and then engage with the community to protect those via patent or copyright and then look from, for partners to help to move those to some type of a product. So we liaise, uh, we support, and at the end of the day, we're a service provider that's trying to add value to translate these inventions to a product. Aha, the patent attorney part of that. Yes. <laughs> UNLV's Business Startup Center uh, is here. Tell me about that and what that's up to. Yeah, so the Startup Center is one of those components in economic development in, in our shop of which technology transfer is a part of. And they're doing a great job. They're focused on uh, individuals from the community as well as at UNLV who have an interest in starting a company. They're able to go to the Startup Center and receive some very useful advice on are they seeking the right product? Um, where are they going to go for some of their uh, initial financing, is that through banks, is that actually trying to be introduced to venture capital arms, and really helping them think through their, their business plan so that they build a nice foundation so when they, they go out, they're ready. They don't have to worry about other pieces, and gosh, you didn't think about that, and have to go back to the drawing board. The Startup Center really helps them with that. There's f quite a few consultants that are part of that that dedicate hundreds of hours um, in, in helping these early stage companies get off the ground. Hmm, very good. Um, you have goals for your office, I'm sure. What are some of them? We do have goals for our office. A lot of what we're working on right now is to develop appropriate processes, document-driven processes, to demonstrate and be transparent to the industry that they know where they can plug in. So that when an invention comes in our doors, it's disclosed to our office, that everyone knows or those stakeholders that are involved in the process knows where it's at in the process and what the next steps are to move that forward. Um, so that's really one of the goals that we're working on right now is developing that process. There's always external goals of getting new inventions in and what are we patenting and what companies have been started and what are we licensing. But we're really trying to get that process sound so that if someone comes in, like yourself, 
says, where do I engage? I can say, you engage here, mm -hmm. and here's how you could be a support and help for us to move this forward. Couple of couple of things in one. One, obviously, you sort of have to keep some of this under wraps because you don't want the whole world to know kind right. of what you're working on. Right. But can you give us some idea of some of the things that uh, you are working on? That I mean, in general terms. Oh, sure, don't definitely. Let the cat out of the bag. No, definitely, <laughs> will do. Um, we have some very interesting cybersecurity research that's going on. So some new encryptions there. Uh, we've got some relationships that are uh, coming up with industry, some bigger partners that will hopefully provide some additional benefits in the computing uh, arena. We actually have some cancer therapeutics that have been disclosed to our office that we're trying to attract some of the bigger therapeutic companies. And we've got some exciting software research as well as um, new therapies and HIV that are coming out of UNLV. So the UNLV that you know that's sitting downtown Las Vegas has some really exciting research and some opportunities coming up to partner with bigger companies. Fascinating. I wish you nothing but the best of luck. Thank you. For, for your sake, for the school's sake, for the community, and for the you know, population of the world, probably. We are excited to be involved in it, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, take it to the next level, hopefully. Zach, thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate it. We'll be right back. found every hazard out here today? Think again. The spot you missed could be a killer. That spot on your skin could be skin cancer. Fact is, if you're a man over 50, you're in a group most likely to develop skin cancer, including melanoma, the kind that kills one person every hour. One in five Americans is likely to develop a form of skin cancer during their lifetime. That's why your best shot is to check for a spot. It's easy. Follow through and check your skin. It could be the save of a lifetime. Go to spotskincancer.org to find out how. A message from the American Academy of Dermatology. Oh, hey, bud. Oh. Where, uh, where are you headed? Uh, I'm just gonna hang out. It's a school night. With Gary and Todd? Yeah. Not sure about those two. I've been meaning to ask you. This is tougher than I thought. Is there any drinking going on in this crowd? No. I hope not, because alcohol can lead you to say things and do things that you really wish you hadn't. Isn't this what you're supposed to say? I know. So if any of your buddies ever pressure you to take a drink, just tell them you promised your dad you wouldn't. I'd do anything to keep you safe. Okay, I will. I hope this is working. I promise. Love you too, Dad. They really do hear you. Ryan. Yeah? So start the conversation even before they're teenagers. Good idea. For tips on what to say, visit underagedrinking.samsa.gov. A message from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Welcome back, everybody. Mark Yosiloff is the managing member of Well Suited, a product creation company, but he's also in, has been instrumental in the development of a new class here on campus. Kelby Weiler put together a short package on that class. UNLV's experimental class in gaming innovation may lead to some new games on the UNLV strip. About a dozen patents have or will be filed based on ideas created by students. The class is the brainchild of former gaming executive Mark Yosiloff. I ran a company that uh, the Wall Street Journal named as one of the 35 most innovative consumer companies in the world. And we generated a lot of intellectual property in a variety of areas of gaming. So it occurred to me that not all the good ideas come from the professionals. In fact, it's the other way around. The Yosiloff Family Foundation provided a gift of $250,000 to lead 20 students through the process of game design and development. Students listened to lectures by Yosiloff, heard from guest speakers, and spent a lot of time presenting their ideas. One of the first things we did was sign a non-disclosure agreement. And once that was signed, there was a level of safety. We began by having them give us the spark of an idea. And then over time developing that with critique from mentors, uh, other students, and finally uh, refining these ideas to the point where we now have somewhere between 11 and 13 actual patentable ideas 
Roger Snow came in and listed the top 20 grossing table games and talked very specifically about what made each of them work. The quality and quantity of ideas from the experimental class led to a grant from the state to expand the class into a larger program. This is a true partnership between business and the community and the university uh, to create this center to allow innovation to take place. Yosilov will continue to be involved in its evolution. But for right now, he's busy helping students with patent applications and arranging for meeting with industry professionals. From spark of an idea, they will now be in the meetings with some of the largest gaming companies in the world, presenting their ideas and seeing if they can become commercially viable. For UNLV Research Files, I'm Kelby Weiler. Mark Elseloff is here now to talk a little bit more about uh, all the things that are going on in that class. But first, you've got a whole number of titles now. Tell us a little bit about what else you're doing. Well, I, I actually used to have a lot of titles, but I'm, uh, I am the retired chairman and CEO of Shuffle Master. Right. And um, since my retirement, I've been involved in product development uh, through my own little company, Well Suited LLC. Mm -hmm. uh, and now um, I'm back to my roots teaching again I started as a college professor oh, okay. um, many years ago and have now come full circle <laughs> and I'm back in the classroom again. Are you happy? Do you like I'm, that? I'm very happy. It's good to deal with the students, huh? It's wonderful to deal with the students. The, the best part of dealing with these students is that they have great ideas and no egos. Ah. Unlike most people who Especially have great business, ideas yeah. and have been in business long enough and have much larger egos. Yeah. You, you've got nearly a dozen patents or uh, packet patentable ideas so far in that class. That's impressive. This was a real experiment. Uh, I had no idea what would happen, but we created an environment in which the students could um, start with the spark of an idea and we helped to mold those ideas and uh, bring them to fruition. We've actually filed already uh, four provisional patents. I have drafts of three more and when we're all done I would say it'll be uh, it'll be somewhere 11, 12, 13 patents which is amazing from 17 students. Wow, yes. And it's going to be expanded? Yes. Um, the whole structure of this which uh, really is the result of my watching products be developed over a number of years. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we've created this environment and we're now going to try and replicate this in several ways. Uh, first, we'll continue to have a student facing course just as we did last fall. So we teach it in the fall. The spring is being uh, um, taken up by getting the patents actually written, filed, and going out to the industry and trying to sell them. Mm -hmm. uh, we also plan to have a community facing uh, class. It'll be open to folks in our community. I'm not sure yet what the entrance requirements will be because we're going to limit it again to 20 mm. uh, and we're going to put them through the same program. This is a partnership between the school, business, the community and everything else. Why are each of those elements so important? Well, th this started, um, this whole notion actually arose in my mind after listening to Governor Sandoval talk about his desire to keep Las Vegas as the intellectual property capital of the world for gaming. And I thought about it. My company was named by the Wall Street Journal as one of the 35 most innovative consumer electronic companies in the world during the time that I was running the company. Mm -hmm. We produced a lot of ideas and I started to think m many of those ideas did not come from professionals. They came from people who just had an idea. And so that was the experiment. Let's take a bunch of motivated students with ideas and put them in an environment where we teach them the math, the patent law, a little business law, a little psychology, a little sociology. We teach all the elements. Then we do case studies. Uh, I brought in some of the top people in the industry and they talked about their experiences. How did they get to be a top table game designer, a top slot designer, and so on. And then we spent a lot of time with the students pitching their ideas, starting with a spark, mm -hmm. 
to a more of a developed product and ultimately uh, with the help of their fellow students and mentors who helped, these became patentable ideas. How did you select those 20 students? Um, they, that's, there were some prerequisites to begin with, but ultimately we took students who were motivated to do this. They, I think they came with ideas. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how good the ideas would be, but I think they began by having some notions. Uh, as we went through the class, some of them abandoned their original ideas and, and moved on. And some of the mentors came from the industry. We had a judging at the end in which some very prominent industry people came in who had not seen any of the ideas before and critiqued them. Mm. All very valuable for the students. Just about 30 seconds. Where do you think this, this plan, this class, and the university will be in five years? Well, we've well, 30 done, seconds. We've, 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 yeah, that's 30 yeah, seconds. Right. No, but we've done some projections. Uh -huh. uh, we think that uh, the pace that we're on, this will actually have a big, a real economic impact uh, in that it will create products and jobs. And one important thing, as casinos proliferate around the world, mm -hmm. the dollars generated by the intellectual property will come back to Las Vegas in royalties, in payments, and so on. And so that's how we can keep at the forefront of all of this. Mark, thank you very much. Fascinating. My pleasure. I thank appreciate you. it. Time now for our final break. Bo Bernard will join us when we come back. Stay right where you are. Every year, millions of young women try to change the skin they were born with and say they die for darker skin. Sadly, some actually do. Change your thinking, not your skin. Stop tanning. Learn more at spotskincancer.org. I remember the moment clearly. I'll never forget that moment. As long as I live. I realized that moment. When we first saw the damage, these people really needed us. And I was going to make a difference right here in my community. Together with local responders, we cleared trees and collapsed walls. We had to get to the family trap beneath. As a citizen soldier, I made a difference. Be there for your community at NationalGuard.com. I don't think anyone captured my first steps on camera. I was the fifth kid, and by that time, first steps weren't a big deal. I was 16 and driving home with my brother Ben. A distracted driver hit us. Ben died on impact. I had 47 days in a hospital bed for reality to settle in. With a major spinal cord injury, doctors said I would never walk again. But deep down, I knew I would. I prayed that every day. Family, friends, strangers, all started to pray for me to be able to walk again. The progress has been slow, and the victories hard won, but I feel the prayers. Whether you need support in a tragedy, or just to make it through a bad day, prayer can make a difference. America, let's come together by believing with each other. For someone to come alongside you and say, I'm going to believe with you, it means a lot. Before we were ever treated for breast cancer, we planned for life after breast cancer. We made the choice. That breast cancer would not take something away from us. Unfortunately, not every woman knows her choices. The American Society of Plastic Surgeons is supporting the Breast Cancer Patient Education Act, a bill that will help make sure women who are facing breast cancer surgery are told about all their options. Help bring this important issue to light. Call your member of Congress and ask them to support the Breast Cancer Patient Education Act. Our final guest tonight is an assistant professor of sociology and hotel management, Bo Bernard. Bo, thank you for being with us. For Talked a lot with Mark about his, his project that's going on here at the university. Uh, I read an article that you said that Las Vegas needs to sort of be the Houston of gambling. That's right, and uh, actually it's appropriate that Zach went first and then Mark talked about a very strong illustration of all the great work that Zach's doing. And all this leads to, of course, Las Vegas is an intellectual capital, much like Houston is the intellectual capital of what's now a global energy industry. Mm -hmm. Energy moved abroad, which is the same thing that happened with gambling. Of course, Macau is yeah. generating tons of revenues, 
Many of those revenues, of course, though a lot of those dollars are, are, are traceable back to a Las Vegas HQ. So we're becoming like a Detroit, right? Very much like a, like a Houston, in that the world's gaming and entertainment economy, the entertainment economy related to gaming, um, traces its intellectual and business roots to this community. We're much more of a global community than we, uh, or a global capital than we were uh, when I was growing up here, for example. You uh, hosted a, a, a a gambling research conference here in Las Vegas last May. What did you see out we of that? Did. What did you hear about that? And from? this is an illustration of that status. The world's professors, and now there are 450 of these researchers all over the planet that study everything from the neuroscience, the brain chemistry that drives the gambling act, all the way up to at a macro level, um, questions like the one that Japan is facing right now. Japan is looking to bring some of our companies potentially into their backyard, into Tokyo and Osaka. What happens to a nation when you bring a casino into to, uh, into these jurisdictions. So from the sort of molecular level all the way out to the global level and back again, this was the world's researchers coming to Las Vegas, because after all, this is the best place to debate these, these issues and study these things. We used to be just the hotel school, uh, the school of hotel administration. Yeah. It's gone way beyond that now, Way right? beyond that, yeah. So I'm the executive director of a place called the International Gaming Institute, and we're on the corner of Flamingo and Swenson there. And the idea is that uh, you know we're very much an outward-facing building, one that builds bridges with the community in ways mm -hmm that you just heard about through Mark Yosilov's program, which was in our casino lab in the ground floor of our mm -hmm. facility. Um, you know, we'd like to be a place that reaches out beyond Maryland Parkway, so to speak, into uh, the broader community. How do you get to people about the debate over gambling and what it does to communities and, and the good and the bad? So we issued a series of papers called the, the Greater Toronto uh, Area Papers, and we looked at these through the lens of Toronto, because Toronto this past year was looking at uh, bringing casinos to their waterfront all the different questions on what happens to a community when you bring this in. And it used to be, you know, years ago, we used to say, well, you know, this, this amounts to bringing the mafia in. And then that sort of issue went away through strong regulation mm -hmm. and, and the cleaning up uh, period that we're also familiar with, those of us who grew up here in Nevada. Um, now there are other issues. There are issues like cannibalization of existing businesses. If you bring a big casino in, is this going to kill the nearby restaurants and the hotels? Um, and the truth is that to, to the degree it's a tourism generating uh, entity, which it often can be, um, the opposite's going to be the case, yeah. that nearby restaurants can in fact do quite well. Um, problem gambling is another issue that we hear quite a bit about. Um, and, and there's a concern, of course, now that, uh, that this will be something that will introduce uh, additional rates of, of gambling addiction. And some of the research that we've seen emerge in that field is, is kind of interesting in that there does appear to be a growth in problem gambling rates at the outset when gambling is first introduced anywhere. Um, but then it sort of levels off and in some cases even declines in what looks to be sort of an adaptation effect in these communities. And of course now, unlike years ago in Las Vegas, gambling's everywhere especially with gambling being online. Uh, and so the period of being introduced to gambling has long since passed um, in most jurisdictions worldwide. Well, Las Vegas is more than just about gambling. Las Vegas is about the whole entertainment. I mean, we're really an entertainment community rather than just a gamble, because you can gamble in Southern California. You can gamble in, in every state in the, in the nation, I think, except Utah. Yeah, Utah and Hawaii, as it Those stands Hawaii. now, are the two places where you, where you can't. And, and what we have is a critical mass of entertainment superstores. Uh, and it's kind of similar to how you know Best Buy suddenly became the place in, in the big boxification of businesses mm -hmm. where you went for all of your electronics needs, right? These places are really big boxes of entertainment and depending on your entertainment needs or desires or wants, uh, you can pursue just about anything uh, under the roofs of, of the places that dot Las Vegas Boulevard. Talk about problem gambling for a minute. Are the hotels and casinos not only here but around the world dealing with it? Are they helping to deal with it or yeah. are they kind of turning a blind eye? Uh, no, I think certainly uh, you know, th this is an area where the science has emerged in really impressive fashion. In addiction in general and in problem gambling in particular, we know so much more about the brain today than we did even 10 years ago. Um, and to a significant degree, this is through support uh, of, of the industry. The industry has supported an entity called the National Center for Responsible Gaming. Um, this is an, an entity that is then in turn funded um, researchers at Yale Medical School, researchers at Harvard Medical School that have looked at things like the brain and, and the alterations in the brain during the addictive process. Um, here in Nevada, we have a project uh, called the Nevada Problem Gambling Project where we tracked we track every person who enrolls in a problem gambling treatment facility throughout the state of Nevada to follow up with them long term and make sure that these programs in Nevada are working. Um, one of the messages we like to send, and this is actually Problem Gambling Awareness Month, March is, okay. um, is that treatment is available, and a lot of people don't realize that that's the case, but in Nevada there's actually very strong treatment and treatment works. We see very strong outcomes through this Nevada Problem Gambling Project where we follow people up 
12 months, 18 months down the road, and their lives have transformed thanks to Nevada's treatment facilities for problem gambling. Now, that's not a gambling story that people think of often right. with Nevada. How, how similar is problem gambling, alcoholism, drug use? Uh, are they very similar? Uh, very much branches off the, off the same tree. In fact, a, a lot of the neurochemistry, again, has revealed that, that these places live in the same parts, uh, these, these, these addictions live in the same parts of the brain. In fact, the most recent uh, DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental disorders places all of those in the same section because of the research that's emerged over the last 10 years suggesting that the brain goes to similar places whether you're an alcoholic or a drug addict or somebody who has a gambling problem and back to the worldwide thing is that enhancing Las Vegas other cities um, we always I, I remember when Atlantic City was legalizing gambling and we yeah. were afraid with the millions of people in New York and Philadelphia and all around there right. it was going to kill us. That was the concern and Is the it? opposite happened, right? People in New York were exposed perhaps to the product by taking a trek down to Atlantic City and wanted to see the Super Bowl of the gambling stuff, and came yeah. to Las Vegas. We're seeing that now. Again, there's all this concern about all this money that's being made in Macau, but A, a lot of that money is being made by Las Vegas companies, right. and B, when you look at the Baccarat numbers here, which are increasing mm -hmm. and fairly dramatically, those numbers aren't coming from Des Moines, Iowa, right? right? These are people who were exposed to the gambling product in Macau, mm -hmm. for example, in Singapore, perhaps, and still want to visit Las Vegas as a place with a critical mass of these big facilities um, that have become very, very enticing for folks around the world. It is fascinating. It's fascinating the things you're learning about all of this. It is. It, it is a fascinating moment in the history of the science of gambling studies. Um, this was a field that was really founded by a University of Nevada professor named Bill Eatington, who passed away this past year. Really the founding father of an academic field when he arrived on the UNR campus in 1969, and we're thrilled down here on the southern campus to carry on the beautiful legacy that Dr. Eatington created. Bo, thank you very much. Fascinating thank stuff. You, Gary. I appreciate it. That will do it for this version of UNLV Research Files. And thanks for being with us. We'll see you again next time. Bye bye.